Rush webinar, where I'm joined by Mr. Matt Diggity. Please do ignore that poster in his background. Don't let him <laughs> highlight any attention to it. Um, Julie Adams and Olesia Korboka. Is that right? Olesia. <laughs> Something like that anyway. Something oh, like that. that even close. <laughs> um, but today's webinar we're going to be talking about how to get an affiliate website from zero to a hundred in the fastest time possible and someone who has many years of experience in doing that is Mr Matt Diggity who's going to be giving us a presentation so Matt the TikTok king um, <laughs> in the background <laughs> So we'll go on to your affiliate stuff in a moment, but are you referring to me as the TikTok king on there? What's no, no, on? no. First off, you're talking, you're talking about this old thing right here. Now, yeah. this isn't a, a big deal. Like, this is just some something I had commissioned today just to celebrate my championship at, as a set, SEO TikTok master. And I thought it would just be appropriate to introduce you to it at the same time. Um, that looks good. Looks good. I'm... Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually lost for words. I can't believe you've got that one on me, man. Um, Julie, you are someone I've not actually... I, I know we've spoke, uh, spoke briefly on the, mm -hmm. the webinar test, but for anyone who doesn't know um, anything about yourself, I know you've came from agency, mm -hmm. recently into affiliate, but you know where are you based currently? And uh, just give us a bit of a background on you know what you're doing. Sure. Uh, thanks, Craig. I'm based out of Orlando, Florida, so in the U.S. I've been doing SEO total for about seven years. Six of that was spent at the agency that I worked for, where I started off managing content, and then I worked my way up to become the manager of their entire SEO department. And just about a year ago, actually a year ago next week, is my one-year anniversary of leaving and doing affiliate full-time. Excellent. Excellent. And I take it it's all going well. Never oh, been yeah. back. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I'm loving it. Good stuff. And my be most bestest friend in the whole of Ukraine, um, Olesia, who's been looking after me for the past few days. Uh, I joined Olesia on a Telegram talk and uh, she was showing me the ropes and bashing a few people about for me, stamping her authority. Olesia. Thank you for coming on today. But for anyone who doesn't know you, um, give us a bit of background about what you do on a daily basis. Uh, I'm mostly in lead generation business and I'm SEO in besides that, accumulate leads and also doing this. Um, I'm also studying knowledge graphs and uh, application for SEO. Interesting. And that is as brief as your description as well. <laughs> but you uh, because uh, I'm not selling anything just <laughs> <laughs> um, and back to Mr. Matt Diggity I'm sure you don't really need much of an introduction but Matt for anyone who doesn't know what you do um, can you just give us a brief background to how you're killing it out in Thailand yeah yeah I got a, an intro slide like coming up pretty soon when we get in the presentation but apparently like just in a nutshell, I'm an ex-engineer that started doing affiliate SEO and found freedom with affiliate and started traveling full time. Currently living out in Thailand, where I've been for the last six or seven years, and loving it. Um, excellent, excellent. And guys in the live chat, give us a shout and let us know where you're from. Someone saying they're from Mongolia. I'm not sure if that's a wind up or not. Mad Singles is here. Um, <coughs> Yeah, let us know where you're from, guys, in the chat. We will be going over to Matt for his presentation um, in just a minute, and then we will be getting feedback from Julie and Alessia. But if you guys have got questions that you want to put to any of these guys, put them in the chat, and we will come back and answer them after the presentation. So, yeah, we've got a lot of people here, and I think it's a good time to start now. We've got Florida, Phoenix, India, Mongolia all over the place so mr diggity tiktok champ um confirm mm -hmm. the stage is now yours all right hold on let me just switch over to full screen mode <clears throat> all right so craig can you just confirm that everything is looking good full screen you can hear me clearly 
can hear you and the screen is perfect. Yes, you can go for it. All right, here we go. So today we're going to be talking about how to get an affiliate website from zero to 100 as fast as possible. Let's just go ahead and get into it. I'm going to show up a graph right here. And basically, this is profit growth for an affiliate website that we acquired. If we look over the 12-month time span, it's, it had 829% profit growth. We started at about 2.1K and eventually 12 months later, got it to 20.2K. Expanding this out a little bit further, we see 2,304% profit growth over 21 months, which again, we started at 2.1K and eventually got to 50.5K. So this presentation is completely about the techniques and strategies that we use when we first get a hold of an affiliate website, when we first start an affiliate website, and we're trying to scale it up as fast as possible. So that's what the focus of today's presentation will be. And in case you're curious about how this project ever ended up, it eventually flipped. We got a valuation for 711000 and closed the deal on this thing. So this is just where things can end up. When people say that affiliate marketing is dead, affiliate SEO is dead, it kind of breaks my heart because the truth of it is it's a, it's a nice path to freedom. It's a nice path of doing SEO on your own terms without clients. Now, um, in case we haven't met before, my name is Matt. I was born in a city called Fresno, California. It's also known as the armpit of California. We're very proud of that. Believe it or not, I decided to leave Fresno and go to San Diego to study electrical engineering where I got a master's degree and eventually started working in the field as an engineer. 2002, working for a Silicon Valley company. This company's job was to produce a piece of software that allowed micro semiconductor companies to determine whether or not their microchips would work once they're fabricated. I know it sounds exciting, but it was really actually just hell. I was working about 60 hour weeks in a cubicle, just dreading every part of it. And around 2009, a buddy of mine handed me the four hour work week and I got, became fixated on trying to figure out how to make money on my own terms. And I immediately started out with affiliate SEO. Around 2011, started making enough money, replacing my engineering salary. I decided to quit working for the man leave the US, I sold all my crap, sold my condo, and just started traveling full-time and exploring this life as a full-time SEO. Since then, it's looked like this. I've founded Diggity Marketing. This is basically my blog where I blog about tested SEO techniques. So I still am an engineer at heart. I like to test anything and everything that could potentially become part of my SEO process. So nothing is real in my process in, until it's tested in Google's actual algorithm. So if you go to my blog, you'll see me talking about that stuff quite often. I also perform SEO consulting to beginner and advanced SEOs all the way to the agency level. I'm the founder of, of a seven-figure affiliate marketing agency called LeadSpring that's completely dedicated to building, ranking, monetizing, and eventually flipping affiliate websites. I have a, a seven-figure client-facing agency called The Search Initiative. I have a backlink service called Authority Builders. I have a, a course called The Affiliate Lab, and I'm the host of the Chiang Mai SEO Conference. Let's talk about the agenda, what we're going to be talking about right now. If we go look from the left to right here, this is a basic high-level overview of the process you might go through when you first start working on an affiliate website. So we start with acquisition. After that, you're going to do a major audit to figure out what you need to do to get this website in your, up to your own standards. And then we start to do an overhaul on the on-site SEO, tweaking content, messing with content, stuff like that. After that, we get into content flow. So how do I set up my keyword research process and how do I start producing content? And then we lay out a backlink strategy. Eventually, you keep that up for long enough and then your website just starts to become an authority site. So key, key characteristics of authority sites is they start to rank for keywords quite quickly whenever you post new content. It's a, it's a great thing. So eventually, you tr transition over to being an authority site and you're gonna make some different moves to cement yourself into that position. Lastly, when you feel like you maxed out the niche or you're ready to move on, you can prepare for an exit. So what we're going to be talking about today, because this is a quite, quite brief presentation, and this is obviously a very big process, we're going to be talking about what you do in the first 30 days. So we're focusing on the first two phases, acquiring the website and the super audit. So what you do when you're auditing the website and get that rolled out in the first 30 days. So if you're asking yourself the question, is this black hat? We just saw a website grow from 2K per month to 50K per month. There must be some magic tricks involved. This must be black hat. No, relax. There's none of that going on here. We're just talking about on-page SEO here. We're not even getting into backlinks here. 
all I want to do right now is just show you what all is possible as fast as possible with a website, an affiliate website. Okay. Now let's start off with why you would purchase a website instead of building one from scratch. And I'm also going to give you some criteria to use whenever you're buying a website. Now check this out. Why would you purchase a website instead of build, building one? So if we start right here on the left-hand side, first you get to know the minimum earnings that this niche could make. Now I've been doing affiliate SEO for about, over 10 years, and I would say I'm better than most people at figuring out how much money a niche could make. That said, I'm wrong more than I'm right. I'm definitely wrong more than I'm right. It's a very challenging thing to figure out if a website can rank in a certain niche and also how much money that will earn. But if you're buying a website, you get to see the profit and loss sheet from whoever's selling it. You get to see all the numbers up front. So you know, even if I did nothing, this is the bare minimum this niche can make. Is it good enough for me, right? Second, you get to avoid the damn Google sandbox. No one likes to work on a site that's not moving. And then lastly, it's efficient use of resources. So at my agency, LeadSpring, my most expensive resource is human resource. We like to hire A players. We like to hire the best of the best. And the worst thing I could do is waste their time on a website that's not moving along, that's in the sandbox. That's where the costs really start stacking up for me. So I'd, I'd rather get them moving on a project that's going to get results quickly. Now, let's take a look at two different timelines here. We'll compare two different timelines. One is we're, we're bu building a website from scratch, and the other one is we're buying a website from scratch. And they're all both going to end up at the same place. $500 per month. So let's imagine we're building from scratch and we want to take this brand new website from zero to $500 a month. Let's do some cost estimations here. Let's start with content. I'm estimating this would take at least $4,500 in content. So we can start with 50 articles of content, something like that. We'll say average 1,500 words per article and we'll say six cents per word. So that's 4.5K. And this is, this is pretty lenient. It, it could definitely go more expensive than that. For backlinks, I'm going to give a large range here. I would say on the low end, you could pay as little as $1,000. If you're doing all the work yourself, you're doing the outreach yourself, you're spending all your time building the links and only going for the free ones. It's going to take a long time though. Or if you're buying backlinks, it could go all the way up to the 10K range, especially if you're not getting very good deals. And for those of you thinking like, okay, well, I don't like to pay for backlinks. It, Look at it like this. If you're not paying for backlinks, you're paying for something else. You're paying for the content for guest posts. You're paying for the tools you use to outreach. You're paying for your staff time that you're using for link prospecting. So there's always a cost, and that's why I put the very, very, very minimum, and I think this is optimistic, at 1K. After that, here's another big range. I'm going to quote 0 to $20,000 in operator costs. So zero, if you're doing all the work yourself and you're not hiring a damn person, you're writing all the content yourself or all the way up to 20K where you have a full team and you're, you're hiring them out, you're paying all the content writers, content editors, and people like that. So grand total cost, a big range here, 5.5K all the way up to 36K. And it's probably gonna take you somewhere between three to 12 months. Like you could get lucky and it could be three months, but it could take as long as a 12 month range. Now let's look at the same scenario. We're gonna acquire a website that's making $500 a month. This is going to cost you about sixteen dollars to $20,000 using typical valuation models that you see at the marketplace. And you see right off the bat right here, this cost, $16,000, is right in the middle of what we would expect for building from scratch. Like you, you can even spend more than that if you're building from scratch. So is it more expensive? Sure, it's more expensive than if you did all the work yourself and it took 12 months or more, but it's, it's within reasonable range. But the time it takes to get here is zero. You're starting out with that right away. And this is the big clinch here. The real cost comes down to opportunity cost, right? So if we look here at this graph I showed you before, you see that we started at 2.1K, we eventually got to 50K. When you're building from scratch, like we talked about, you're adding three to 12 months onto this timeline. Why would you delay a $50,000 month ahead of you, right? This... $12,000, $20,000 site you're considering buying, like that's a drop in the bucket once this website's making $50,000 a month. So this is the way I look at it. It's, it's opportunity cost. I don't want to tack on a solid 12 months before I start getting to the high profit ranges. So this is my argument why I like to buy websites instead of build it. I'm sure we'll have discussions because there's plenty and plenty of arguments for 
building a website and I agree with them too, but it's, it's always a good discussion, but this is my typical strategy these days. That said, a lot of the time I still build when there's nothing to buy. When I really want to get into a niche and I can't find one. So I still build too. Now, okay, so where can you purchase affiliate websites? Let's start with the marketplaces. Some examples we have here are Empire Flippers, FE International, Investors Club, and Flippa. And these guys usually price affiliate websites using a model that takes a monthly profit and multiplies that by a multiplier between 30 and 40x. So if you have a website making $10,000 a month, that could sell for $350,000. Now, these sites usually have a minimum on marketplaces for making $500 a month. So at the bare minimum, you're looking at spending $15,000 for one of these sites through marketplaces. The advantage of a marketplace is it's a vetted experience. So Empire Flippers, FE International, they're going to vet the sellers. They're going to vet the websites and make sure you're not buying a lemon. Other options, private deals through Facebook groups. So some examples of Facebook groups would be the Flippin' Websites Facebook group. My, web, my group, Affiliate SEO Mastermind, a lot of deals going on through there. And what you're looking for here is quote unquote starter sites. So these are sites that haven't really hit that $500 a month. They might be quite small and they don't fit those typical valuation models. They're typically priced based on how much content's been added, the potential of the niche and stuff like that. So most of the time when you're doing these kind of deals, you're, you're simply trying to make a deal with the other person to make them feel emotionally okay with letting go of something they spent their time and money on. So an example of a website that I purchased through this route, and a lot of my, my purchases come through this route. I bought a website for 1.5K. It's a nice branded domain. And it's making $25,000 a month now. And it's one of our top sites in the portfolio. We see it growing to the stratosphere. It's a great place to get websites like this. After that, private deals through outreach. So let's imagine that you really want to get into like this hardcore micro niche, like college essays or something like that. You can, you're going to wait 15 years to find one on Empire Flippers or marketplaces like that. You shouldn't just wait for something to magically appear on a marketplace if it's a small niche. So instead, what you can do is Google your main keyword, locate websites on page two to four, and then start outreaching to these guys offering to buy their websites. Now, let me just give you fair warning. You're going to expect a poor response rate because if there's any affiliates on this, on this webinar right now, like how often are you checking your, your inbox for your affiliate websites? Probably never, right? So expect poor response rates and then long negotiation processes. Like these guys have dollar signs in their eyes. They're not ready to sell. You have to talk them into that. Okay, so when you're auditing a website, I this is a process I use. I recommend you use, use doing this process with a buddy of yours. One of them is gonna be a good cop and that's the person that's trying to argue against the bad cop that I really want to go into this niche for these reasons. Then the other person is going to be the bad cop and they're trying to block you from buying the website. They're trying to talk you out of it for various reasons. So let's look at the good cops criteria. First in the realm of niche research, we're trying to check and see if it's a trending niche. So if this niche is trending, even if I do nothing, if I don't grow the traffic, the traffic's going to go on its own because the niche is trending itself. So that's a good thing. Is it what I like to call an oh shit niche? No, oh shit niche is the kind of niche where people are going to get that out their wallets for. It's, it's those those problems that are that are recession proof that people will just do anything to solve. Think about the big three: health, wealth, and relationships. I only operate in these niches. Is it a branded domain? So I'm looking for domains that can scale to the stratosphere. Like I don't want bestrouterreviews.com. I want tech pros so I can get into routers hosting and all that kind of stuff related to, to tech. Is it an authority website? So key feature of the authority website is it starts to rank for, for new keywords as soon as you publish new content. It's a great thing. So you want to keep your eye out for one of these. One thing you could do is just check to see if it has any solid keywords on page one. Google's not going to put websites on page one for good keywords unless they really like the website. The other thing you can do is cross correlate. You can see when was the last time they posted something and then when did that post start getting traffic itself? And then you would know, okay, well, it took two weeks time for this, this particular post to start pulling traffic and ranking. It must be an authority site. Let's get this. And then it's a content play here. We can just start in influxing content here. And then we get into some monetization quick wins. You want to make your money back as soon as possible. So are there more products to review? So we can do a content gap analysis and see 
check with our competitors and see well, what products they review and which products that I've reviewed. Do they have a lot more and can we catch up to them? And then can we switch out affiliate offers? Is it monetized mostly with Amazon, which we all know is terrible? Can we switch them to private offers and stuff like that? And then lastly, if they are monetized with Amazon, are any of these products out of stock or do they have bad reviews or, or anything like that? Let's switch up these, these rankings. Then lastly, you're looking for some SEO quick wins. And, I, and your hint here is you're gonna look for technical SEO wins because anything, any kind of technical problems like index bloat and stuff like that, when you get those resolved, it's usually a quick turnaround time. Now with bad cop, all right, what's bad cop look at? First, does it have a clean backlink profile? I have no problem with PBNs and stuff like that. I just want them to be mine. I don't want them to be other people's. Second, is, has it had a recent penalty? So check traffic graphs. Did it just get ding like in May? That's, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. After that, does this niche require a super geeky level of knowledge to write about it? So like, I really like fantasy books and novels, but there's no way I'd be able to write about it or find a writer who could talk about every single fantasy book. It's just unscalable. Other unscalable things would be if it requires frequent updates. So like we just talked about routers before, like being in the router niche, those things come out every five minutes. So you have to constantly update your list and stuff like that. After that is a fad niche. Is it like hoverboards and it's going to die out? Are the sites ranking above it super old? Are you up against Wikipedia, WebMD, Healthline? Like, yeah, stay away. And then lastly, is it a your money, your life niche? So it's a, is it like medical or is it like legal advice, financial advice? It's just going to be constantly scrutinized over time by Google's algorithm. So let's say you decide you want to buy the website. Good cop wins the battle. You get the website over into your registrar, your hosting. It's all live. Now what do you do? Now it's time to do this, what we call the super audit. We don't have a fancy name for this. It's, it's an audit we use at LeadSpring. We think it's super. So here it is. Step one, what we're going to do is a technical audit. Like I said before, this is where your quick SEO gains are going to come from. Now, a list of things we do here is first things first, speed optimization, WP Rocket, Nitro Pack, optimizing images, all that good stuff. Get on a good host, get a CDN popping, and then move on. Indexing cleanup, so making sure you're not wasting indexing on category pages or thin content pages or tags and all that kind of stuff, authors. All that stuff, just make sure Google is only indexing the pages that you want them to look at. After that, you would be surprised at how often we see this at our agency, the search initiative, affiliates that don't know follow their affiliate links. And then you just do an audit and you make them all no follow. And then the site just ranks higher because you keep all that link juice on the site. After that, we can look at keyword cannibalization. Make sure you don't have any pages competing for the same keywords. And if you do, de-optimize the offending one. Later, we can look at 404 errors and just 301 and clean them up. And then lastly, look at thin content. And maybe just decide, okay, do I de-index de this, 301 it, or just get rid of it altogether? Step two, now you're doing keyword research. You're reverse engineering the competition to do keyword research. So what we can do here is enter a competitor's domain in SEMrush. We can do a domain analysis, go to domain analysis, go over to organic research and look at positions. Here you can see I'm reverse engineering Diet Spotlight. And then down here below, these are all the keywords that Diet Spotlight possibly ranks for. So you take these, you add them to a list, and then you rinse and repeat for all the competitors in your niche. You get a big list of keywords, and you start assigning them to pages based on relevance, topical, topicality, and stuff like that. After that, you're going to have that big list of content you need to write out, right? So here's what I re recommend doing. I recommend making a table like this. And for the columns here, in the left-hand side, you're going to have the topic or the keyword that you're going write, to write about. The next column is whether or not this piece of content is monetizable or not. So can it make money? Can I recommend affiliate products here? The one after that is, is it on a solid affiliate program, i.e. non-Amazon? And then search volume. Does it have a decent chunk of search volume where we can get some visitors, start making some money? And then relevance. The, now, here's a, here's a kind of tricky one. Is it? Is this certain keyword, is this topic relevant to the current state of my website right now? So like, let's imagine in this case, I have a website that's targeting like uh, different ways to lose weight, right? But I haven't quite talked about supplements yet. So something like a Raspberry Ketone Reviews is not in line with the current content that's on the website. So I'd give that a 0.5. So then for our total here, we, we total these up, we sort them, and then we start working our way down the list. Then step four 
you're going to reverse engineer yourself. You're going to try to find out which keywords that you're ranking for and you're looking for a couple surprises here. Now they're going to come in two forms. First, you're looking for keywords ranked five through 10. So these ones are the ones that are almost there. They just need a little bit of a nudge to get into those money-making spots one through four. So what you can do here, a couple solutions is one, send a target anchor text link. If you're trying to rank for best protein powder and the, the anchor text best protein powder has never been sent to that page, it's a, still a huge, awesome ranking factor. So send a link with best protein powder to that page. Another thing you can do is look at keyword density. So a, long, a lot of the time, you're ranking for best protein powder, but you don't have that exact phrase on the page. So you might have protein powder that most people think is the best on the page. It doesn't have the exact best protein powder phrase on there. So just put it in there an appropriate amount of times. And we can talk about what is appropriate later. Uh, keywords on page two or three. So these are what I like to call accidental rankers, meaning you had no clue, you, had, you didn't mean to optimize for these keywords, but you're just accidentally ranking for them anyways. An example of this might be, if you're trying to rank for best ergonomic chairs and you find out this page is accidentally ranking for a keyword like scoliosis ergonomics because you happen to say one of these chairs is really good for those with scoliosis. So what you do here is either build out its own subsection on that page or just make a standalone page. So Google already likes you for this keyword, so just run with it and give them more of what they want to see. Now, step five, I recommend doing a content audit with Surfer SEO. So Surfer SEO is one of those tools and it's going to look at the top people ranking for your, your keywords, and it's going to look at commonalities between them. It spits out a lot of data. So there's a lot of things that you could look at, but here's the, th the three things that I definitely recommend focusing on. First is entity optimization with true density. So like what this does is if I want to rank for best affiliate networks, like you see that keyword here, I can analyze the people in the top three positions, and it'll give me a report saying, well, you've only used the words best affiliate networks uh, twice, everyone else is using on an average of three, add it one more. But you see like all these, uh, these red warnings down below, like I haven't even written the word affiliate link or social media or digital marketing on the page. So that's, that's what everyone else is doing on page one, so we should do the same. Other things is subtopic coverage. So if I'm trying to write about how to lose belly fat, so I would Google how to lose belly fat or use Surfer to, to do this for me, and then look at the H2s and H3s of the people already ranking for these keywords and then I'd put them in my content. I'd make them the subtopics, my headings, as, as a superset of all the guys ranked in the top positions. And then lastly, word length. So I just want to make sure I'm not writing a 10,000 word article when everyone else is getting away, away with 1,000. Moving on, I'm going to do a backlink audit. So there's a lot of things. I just did a webinar on how to vet backlinks. So you can check that out on my YouTube channel. But here's a 15-point checklist that I look at. First, does, all, does the website I have a link from have a decent chunk of traffic? Is it actually ranking in Google? Is the traffic location ranking where I want to be ranking? Is this link contextual? Is it like an actual link in the article, not a sidebar footer link? I check some basic metrics. I make sure this, this page I'm getting a link from isn't just orphan. I check an incoming versus outgoing link ratio. Make sure this, this website I'm getting a link from isn't just a, a link farm. I check for balanced anchor text, make sure it's not spammed. Look for social activity on the site, at least having a Facebook page, Twitter, and stuff like that. I'll make sure it has some kind of SSL. It's not a deal breaker, but it's nice to have. And then definitely checking relevance. Is, it, is the article or is the website itself relevant to what it's linking to? And then some red flags to look out for. Like I don't want to get links from any kind of sites that are labeling them as incentivized links. I don't want to get like, I'm okay with guest posts, but I don't want a, a big label on the link, the page that I have a link that says this is guest post, right? It's dead giveaway that, that there's some incentivization going on for that link. Wayback Machine, just making sure I don't have a link from PBN. Check for steep traffic declines recently. Google might have penalized the site. Look for spammy anchor text. Does it have like casino anchor text and stuff, adult stuff like that? And then lastly, check for a site devaluation. So what you can do is you can estimate how big a website is just by looking at seeing how much how frequently they're posting. And then if you do a site colon and look at their domain and you estimate this website should be a thousand pages, but Google's only indexing 40, guess what, they hate it. So you can do all this stuff and audit your backlinks, but if we're talking the theme of this webinar is saving time and doing things quickly, I just outsource it to this guy. So Rick Lomas, he's an expert at Link Detox. He'll just look at my backlink profile and he'll just tell me, here's your disavow file, move on.
No, step seven. We're going to put away the tools and do some word of mouth niche research. So what we're doing here is we're going to jump into a few places and ask the people that are actually into the niche what are the best products and topics in the niche to talk about so we can talk about those. So some places to go is Facebook groups. Here's an example of me jumping into one of them. Have you guys ever had any supplements of blah, blah, blah work for you? If so, which ones? Quora is pretty good. Reddit's good. And Answer the Public's quite good for figuring out topics to talk about. Now, step eight, click-through rate optimization. So this is a great quick win for a new affiliate site. And what's click-through rate optimization? It's making sure that you're getting the most clicks possible from the search result in Google. So if we look here, this is what's called the title, SEO title tag. Down here is the meta description, right? And these two highly influence what people, the likelihood someone clicks on something. Don't sleep on click-through rate. If we think about what Google's goal is, their goal is to serve up to the reader what they want to read. What better indicator of that than what people click on and how long they read it for? So don't sleep on the click-through rate part. So check this out. Here's a graph showing the percentage of clicks you would get based on the different positions on page one and two. As you can see here, positions one through four take up a huge majority of it. So it's within your best interest to optimize for click-through rate here. So some examples of what I would do is use numbers in your titles. I put in the year and the month to show that it's current. You can use power word to add emotion, use brackets to draw the eye. And an example of this might be nine insanely ridiculous ways to trigger people on social media 2020. Now, lastly, baseline conversion rate optimization. What I, what I mean by baseline is you're not gonna do any A-B testing here. What you're just gonna be doing is you're gonna roll out all the stuff that you know works. This is your tried and true conversion rate optimization, CRO. So stuff like adding featured images to the top of articles. After that, making sure all the content has a lot of urgency and emotion. People don't wanna read a bland article. And I highly stress this one, always having strong introduction paragraphs, guys. So your first paragraph is the only chance you have to hook in the reader. So use techniques like teaching them something new. For example, you could say, in the last six months, 45 different golf drivers have been released to the market. Do you know which one's best? Something like that. You can also use fear. So make someone feel like if they don't read the rest of this article, they're going to buy the wrong golf driver or they're going to get ripped off. Short paragraphs. No walls of text. Make the paragraphs short and punchy, one to two sentences. Use contrasting CDA colors. So for your call to actions, if your website's green, you're gonna look at the color wheel, just Google color wheel. You're gonna look at the opposite side of that color wheel and you're gonna find red. Red is the opposite contrasting color to green and red is gonna be the color of your CTA and you're never gonna use red anywhere else. What that's gonna do is train the viewer to only take action when they see the color red, namely when you make money. After that, remember we talked about replacing the products. So we were reviewing and seeing, okay, what can we replace with non-Amazon products? What, what products were out of stock that we can put different products in those top positions. We're going to switch them around and start getting some gains. Now, I know this sounded like a lot. It went pretty quick, but there's a lot of work to be done. But I'm telling you, this stuff pays off. I'm not sure if you noticed this, but between the first and the second month on this website, we took it from 2.1K to 5.2K. So this stuff pays off. Now, guys, if you're looking for, oh, yeah, let's just talk about this. So going back to the timeline, um, we just covered the first two spots. Of course, there's more. Maybe we can do that for next time. If you're looking for some resources, I put some nice stuff together for you. So download some free resources here. You can go to dignitymarketing.com forward slash SEM rush dash Webby. And you'll find my evergreen onsite SEO guide. You'll see a backlink blueprint. There's some case studies in there, a lot of good things. If you're interested in learning affiliate SEO, check out affiliatelab.am. And if you want me to do your SEO for you, the searchinitiative.com. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to take a drink of water now and stop sharing this. Perfect, Matt. Excellent presentation as always. Um, guys, if you have any questions that we want to put to Matt or any of the other guys, um, then get them in the chat now. Now is the time. But I'm going to move on and give Matt uh, Matt's throat a rest just now um, and jump over to Julie. Um, so, <coughs> Julie, you have um, obviously been into to this affiliate stuff for the last year. Um, and I, I'm assuming, you know, it took you time to transition from 
doing your you know day job to go into affiliate. So, you know, how much of what Matt said there, um, or, or is there anything you can add to what Matt said for someone? Because Matt's done it for ten years. You've came from the person you know trying to get out of their job that they probably hate at the time and trying to get into to affiliate. So Matt's got a very rigid structure process, and clearly it does take time to do it. But someone who's got their back against the wall, like yourself, who wants out, is there anything else you can add that you feel that might help people? Absolutely. So the one thing that um, I disagree with on Matt almost fundamentally is you have a lot of money to work with. You have a lot of resources to work with. Most people don't have that. Um, so from my perspective, the way that I was able to quit my job was putting all of my time and resources into a single site. Now I got that site up to about $40,000 and flipped that with basically doing all of the work myself. So to touch on the importance of technical SEO, again, you can get so far with that. You can go from page two to page one and start making money right away just by fixing up technical stuff. You don't have to spend any money on content. You don't have to spend any money on links as long as you have the backbone um, with technical. So that's definitely the first step I'd agree there. Cool. So um, Alessia, yourself, I know you're not hugely into affiliate, but whether you're doing affiliate client stuff or whatever, is there anything you feel, you know, obviously Matt's given, given us the process Julie's given you know her input. Is there anything you think you could add to that process or suggest that maybe other people could be doing? Um, you know, just when trying to scale things up. Uh, mostly, when I am engaged in affiliate, is when my clients, my ex clients, consult me if they should buy this or that website. And in lead gen, you can sometimes take penalized affiliates, very small websites that have GMBs and use them for each Interesting, interesting. <laughs> and going back to, to obviously give Matt his opportunity to speak on what Julie said, um, you know, what, what would your feedback be and what, what Julie had to say there, Matt? Yeah, yeah. So like I mentioned at the beginning, there's definitely arguments for building websites and we still do it all the time too. When you're first starting out, that's your only option. Like you definitely don't want to take the risk and say, okay, here's 15K. I've never done this before. I hope it works. You know, you, you want to build it from the ground up because it's, it takes some, um, you want to get your hands dirty for sure. So in that case, I highly recommend building from scratch. And in other cases, uh, when, when there's a micro niche site that I, I can't buy from anyone else, I'm building from scratch too. And, uh, but it's just in my, like, like Julie said, in my particular state right now, my team is really expensive. I can't afford for them to work on a site that's not moving. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. I would agree with that. Um, another thing, I don't know if I heard it from you or somebody else, but for people in a perspective where they're just starting off, I've gotten the question of when do you start acquiring sites? Like when do you kind of graduate from building things yourself? To getting to the point where you can actually start to pay for one and my best answer to that is immediately after you've sold one mm. because at that point that's when you have the most money on hand that's when you have the opportunity to invest you're not taking this huge risk so just something for people to think about yeah and, and i don't want to go there i'm not giving tax advice but if you're an american this is yeah. called a, a like sale so you mm -hmm. can you can write off some of the tax on that on the purchase absolutely um, so it's, it's good to jump over and, and take advantage of that and what, what about you, Alessia? I know you don't do affiliate. Is it something that does interest you or have you dabbled in it at all? Or do you feel that you know, you're, you're quite happy doing client work? And, you know, yeah, I'm doing a bit of affiliate. It's like in addition to the lead gen websites. We sometimes buy uh, affiliate websites and add lead gen to them as part of uh, monetization. So it's okay and i'm also studying with in the lab of matt Diggity and reading all his books and uh, in his group so i'm um, more in affiliate than it might seem yeah no that's good um listen we in, can in all... fact in fact uh, matt's uh, course is the best one <laughs> out there oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the invoice will be the uh, I, yeah. I started earning my first uh, money not as an uh, agency but myself when I uh, finished uh, Matt's course. So. Mm. 
Um, <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll go on to questions from the general public because that's why everyone's here. Um, doesn't have to be exactly related to uh, exactly what we've spoken about. You can you know, ask these other questions as well, guys. But first question for you, Matt. Um, what is the most expensive website you've bought if you want to share that? I'd like $50,000. I don't go that big a lot of the time. The, the most ROI I get, so we talked about the different places I buy, so marketplaces, and then um, going into groups and doing getting starter sites and then outreach. And most of the time I'm getting these starter sites and those typically are less than 10K, so 1K to 4K, something like that. And the ROI is great because you don't have that big 40X multiplier kicking in. But I have dipped over to the marketplaces quite a lot, like Empire Flippers, I'm looking at you. And uh, I think the biggest one we bought was 50K. Interesting. No, I think it, it would make sense to keep it semi-low, don't throw hundreds of money at it, because that's where you're getting the most traction at the bottom. I mean, what about you, Julie? Like, I know you're maybe not as bought as many websites as Matt, but are you, do you go in and buy websites at that kind of level? Or what, what way are you looking at it? Definitely not anything in that level. So I'm under 5,000 because my skill set is taking people who have given up on Amazon websites and at this point transitioning them from very low level Amazon 3% sites to negotiating a deal with somebody who's going to pay a lot more. And now you don't even have to get the website ranking any better if you can close a deal instead of 3%, 20%, you've already blasted your income for that site. So that's kind of where I'm at. Alessia, in your experience, when websites are being bought up and stuff like that, um, you know, have you ever been involved in buying a website and what was the, the cost of that? The most priced website that I had to review for my client was $1 million in uh, USA in the home niche. And uh, like, um, he bought it finally for 500K. That, that's it. Negotiate and uh, what I don't like about buying these um, like high-priced websites is that they sometimes go down, drop dramatically within time. So it's not like passive income uh, as treated, but you have to work on that a lot mm -hmm. to maintain the same um, level of income. <laughs> they normally go down when I start doing SEO on them. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'm only kidding. But um, so, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question we have is from Alex Oliveria. Um, another way to monetize your affiliate sites by selling leads and verticals like home services insurance. Do you do anything like that, Matt, or do you just stick to solely affiliate? No, not we don't mix. So we do a little bit of both. I'm, I actually currently make more money from lead gen right now than I do affiliate. But uh, separate, separate websites. We haven't crossed streams, so to speak. And so that's what I do. I cross the stream. <laughs> cross the stream. Yeah, yeah. I make the same website for Legion and Affiliate, and it's yes. easier. Those affiliates will just a network of the websites that are interconnected uh, um, for smaller niches. I think we need to talk. We need to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, what about yourself? No, um, I've tried dabbling in lead gen. I used to do a lot of local work at the agency, um, 80, 90 local SEO accounts. I got burnt out from it. I hate Google My Business. It's just a personal thing for me. I love the passive income associated with just pure SEO that comes along with affiliate. And there's this huge local aspect that goes into lead gen most of the time. So it's just not something I've just been burnt out on it doing it for six years. So. Yeah, no, I, I get that, and I know a lot of guys that do the GMB thing over in America, and it's mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a it's a it? Yeah, it seemed, in my opinion, anyway. But mm -hmm. hey, I'm not doing it. Uh, but no, I can I can get where you're coming from. Um, next question was one of the ones asked earlier on from Vichaslav Azerov. He's basically saying, Matt. Don't you think that micro niche websites are done with these days? Um, and because we're clearly moving to authority and brand building with affiliate websites. Mm, not necessarily. So some niches, you'll only see 
like micro or like EMDs and PMDs ranking. It just depends on what it is. And the advantage of a EMD, PMD or something with the keywords in the domain name is it shoots up faster. It can rank a lot faster. So we've actually been on the hunt. We really want to go into this niche, uh, micro niche and the education niche. And we're, we're outreaching specifically to EMDs and PMDs because we look at page one, we see them all ranking. It's not the case all the time. It's not the case in fitness. It's not the case in health. It's not the case in technology. They're all massive websites, but depends on the SERPs. So here we go. It depends. <laughs> I hate that answer. I hate that answer. Um, I hate it too. I can't believe I said it. Um, what What's your um, take on that question? Um, I mean, I would really just kind of agree with Matt on that. So. And Alessia? Nothing to add. <laughs> Nothing to add. Uh, no problem. I, I think, yeah, yeah Matt, Matt pretty much covered it off pretty well. So there you go. Next question is from Alexandra Kilovia. Um, Matt, you said... Kilova. That, you, yeah, that one, yeah. <laughs> you said you spent um, six cents per word for your websites. Um, what can you recommend for those who are non-native speakers what budget do you spend for proofreading? Well, so for proofreading, so we, we, we don't have proofreaders. We call them content editors. And their job is they manage the writers and make sure they're delivering to schedule and stuff like that. They're an editor in this, the sense to make sure that they're following the, the SOP. But we're assuming that the writers themselves, because they're sent six cents a word, that's not the cheap level. That's like average level getting into the beginning of more high end. We're assuming they can write good themselves and you shouldn't have to proofread them. I would probably, in your case, just when you're interviewing a writer, you get a bunch of samples, you get some samples and then have a single time, like one of your uh, first English first language friends, look at that person's writing and just figure out is it, is it English or not, right? And then move on because I don't think you'll need a full-time proofreader. You shouldn't have to do that for someone. Yeah, so I think we all have problems with content writers. Um, yeah. Julie, you, you know, have you got any tips for you know where you would even get cost effective? Yeah. Good, you know, I, I, I'm based in the UK, and even for me, trying to find a, a native person here who is cost effective, mm -hmm. you know, you know where, where, do, where do we where are you finding these people? So I have one girl that I have been working with uh, since I was at the agency. So I've known her for about four or five years. She started really, really cheap. So about I think, four cents a word. And now she's at uh, five and a half. So I've just been with her for so long that, you know, she knows kind of what I'm looking for. I trust her writing and I think I'm getting an awesome deal. So it's just yeah. uh, for me, it's about building a relationship with the writer. So finding someone you like and then really encouraging them, giving them good instructions so that they know what you're looking for instead of just kind of having 20 or 30 that are okay. Yeah, no, I think hey, Craig. Yeah. Craig, as a non-native English speaker, how do you find proofreaders? Uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I think for, for me, in my opinion, you know, I think content writers are really, really hard to come by. And I think you've got to treat them well, uh, pay them what they're, they're owed. I think we're always, looking at cost in a lot of cases and I think the best thing you can do is if, if you're lucky enough like Julie or, or probably Matt and you know you've got someone keep keep <laughs> going um but yeah I'm getting my my accent slagged again um viva Scotland but over to Ukraine let's pass the buck here very quickly on to someone else who's um English is probably of a similar standard to mine um Alessia what is your advice from getting a good content writer uh when you are dealing with local lead generation mostly you find out that people don't read that content and googlebot doesn't do that either you can put their lorem ipsum safely or just tweak one copy and use it multiple times interesting interesting <laughs> next question is from dmitry alexandrovich matt have you ever bought a website that tanked after the purchase and did it recover? Mm, knock on wood. No, I mean, a lot of them, uh, there's been quite a few that didn't take off like right, right away. 
but I've never had anyone just like straight up penalized. Like, thank goodness. I think like part of the process is you're just taking something that's okay and you're, you're putting a hundred percent into it. So you're trying to avoid that. Like that's what you're doing the first month with the super audit anyways. I'm Julie. Yeah. I would just say to piggyback off of that. Um, I would never buy a website where my skill set is already maxed out. They've already maxed it out. So I'm buying sites where I know that maybe the technical SEO where I'm really strong is lacking. So they know I can get quick wins. I'm never kind of going into something where I feel like there's a roof right above my head on it. Mm -hmm. And Alessia? I had some cases, yes. Um, some of the sites never recovered. That happens. Move on. <laughs> Move on. No, that's cool. I'll just add to that. I feel like a vulture sometimes looking for preying on the naive who just don't understand SEO that well. Um, or understand link building. So mm -hmm. I've got the vulture mentality where I'm just looking a bit like you, Julie, just to yeah. find something where you know you you know there's a lot of room for improvement. So um look for that guys. Question from where is it? It just moved. Um Janice Baznov, Mad Singers Chief. Um, when do you swap from Amazon to another affiliate partner? Amazon, quite a bit of revenue might be for non-direct purchases, but how much direct link sales do you need to make that switch? All right, so this is an awesome question because Amazon converts like crazy and you get that, that long cookie and stuff like that. So if I can find a, a product to replace it that's making a 12% commission, and they have a good landing page, so it needs those two things, 12% commission or more, and a good landing page, I'll make the switch. And Julie, what, what would you um, say about that? You, you know, I know you are um, maybe looking at things differently because Amazon, you know. Yeah, there is a ton of value in Amazon's, I call it the random purchases. There's people who are gonna buy from Amazon, even if it's more expensive because they've just been, trained with the two day shipping. So you can't really combat that. So my way that I go about it is I put the first one or two um, products on the page is something outside of Amazon. Three to 10 could be Amazon products. So that way I'm still capturing those Amazon links for people who just add stuff to their cart and buy it. Um, but I had a website, I think last month where I was looking at how much it made. I got 30,000 clicks from Amazon, made about six grand. I got, uh, I think it was 60 clicks from a manufacturer website, made the same amount of money. So oh, I've seen your Facebook post on that actually. Yeah, exactly. So there's just, you know, I'm never gonna get 30,000 clicks to that other manufacturer site or 30,000 sales because Amazon is just a cart dump, but there's just a lot of value for scooping up those extra things. Interesting. Um, and Alessia, have you got anything to add there? I just follow Matt's advice and never deal with Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Good move. I'm finished with them as well. Um, I just started out and thought, nah, to hell with that. I'm away from that now. Um, commissions are too low for me to make money on it. But guys, if you've got any other questions, we still have seven minutes left. Um, Give me a second just to uh, find some more. There's a lot of compliments here um, for Matt. Just may we? Um, may I ask in the like face of others uh, that Matt would make his own affiliate program marketplace? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we th we thought about that. I mean, it's, it's something you think about a lot. It's a different beast in itself. I don't think I'd be able to juggle. SEO and that it's just so different but I don't know that I mean there's a lot of it's, it's very lucrative um, I have some friends that have went that route and they have sports cars now so there's that <laughs> so, but um yeah I don't know not not for now not for now not for now and to answer your other question Janice Baznov um, how do I feel about the poster in Matt's wall I'm absolutely disgusted with it um, but we'll give it a bit more exposure since he went to the time to rush it in <laughs> at the last minute. But uh, yeah, it caught me off guard with that one. Um, I can, ex I've, I've had a lot of crap online over the years, but never ever have had a poster in someone's wall um, on the <laughs> and all that. You know, it's a a new low 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, all good fun, all good fun. So can't complain. Um, <coughs> but Julie, have you got any questions from you want to put to Matt? Or Matt, have you got any questions we can extract information from Julie? Because you guys are at two different ends of the scale. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're new, Julie. Matt's not. You know, is there anything that you may want to ask Matt? Just for the like, as a as an affiliate person, what would you love? One question, if you could ask Matt, what would it be? Sure. Um, I guess at what point in your portfolio career did you start buying sites? Like, I know you had that first ergonomic chair site back in the day that got tanked. Um, you had said something else. You started with Amazon. At what point, like, not exactly how much money you had in the bank, but you know, at what point in your career did you start acquiring and really scaling? It it actually was wasn't that long ago, maybe like three years ago or something like that. There's been a few milestones in in my affiliate path that have been game changers for me. First is to flip in the first place because mm -hmm. we just had went down a bad model of just trying to have a hundred site portfolio and never have any free time, and never have any profit. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one was just starting to buy rather than build. Um, and we still we still dilly dally in it a little bit, but it wasn't that long ago, but I, I tell you, I wish I did it a long, lot sooner. I wish I did it five years ago, six years mm -hmm. ago, seven years ago. Like you said, as soon as I made my first flip, just transfer that over into a new one. That yeah. would have been the best move. Reinvest is the way to go. Don't go buying sports cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the way that I you, operate. Anyway. You get to learn from my mistakes and just do do the right yeah, things. That I do. <laughs> That's it. Um, Alessia, have you got anything you would want to put to Julie or Matt in terms of a question? You know, because obviously what we want to do, you're obviously an expert, you understand SEO, but what would you ask Julie, for example, if you had one question you could ask Julie about her current affiliate career, what, what would be a good question to ask her? How do you hire people and how do you keep them motivated? Because flipping a website is kind of, can take some time long. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how do you process that with people? Like I said, I'm all about building relationships. I have the same VAs that I've been working with for four years. I give them raises when they do good. You know, I reward them. I've never given anybody a percent commission or anything like that, um, but they're all overseas. So I pay them pretty well for that. And they've just been with me for forever. Interesting answer. And guys, you're still not asking. I mean, Matt, uh, Matt Sanders is talking about, I love awesome links. Tell us more about ABC's A-list. I don't even know mm. what that means. Does anyone know what that means? Uh, ABC is Authority Builders, my backlink service, or A-List is, it's a solution where the problem is like people, people apply to get links for bestpingpongtables.com and try to get a link from Forbes and then they get rejected, right? So what we do is we, if you want a link from high-end websites, we will look at your website and then tell you in advance what you would have access to. That's the difference. Ah, interesting. Had no idea what that was. Um, Eric Schwartzman is asking, have any of you guys ever been manually demoted by Google? I have, for sure. I've had a manual penalty. Anyone else? <laughs> At the agency, yes. Not, luckily not on my affiliate sites, but I've had to deal with mm -hmm. them for clients, which is almost <laughs> more of a headache. And I suppose the follow-up question will be, did it fully recover? Oh yeah, yeah. In like thirty days, just uh, disavow, and then reconsideration request and it's back. Uh, can I, I can I also ask about the multiplier? Did it change because of the recession of of the pandemic or anything else? When you flip the website, did you experience any multiplier changes? I Did haven't. I haven't. Sold? Yeah, I haven't sold since then. So. Uh, I did talk to Joe from Empire Flippers and he said everything's stable because there's there's a lack of inventory right now. Like people are deciding not to sell, like they don't know what's going on and people are kind of like frozen in the market. So there's a lack of inventory and he thinks that's the reason things have been stable. But I haven't sold since COVID. Interesting, interesting. But sadly guys, we are out of time, but before we do wrap up, um, I'll start with you first, Alessia, because you've been last in a lot of the other cases. If anyone wants to find out more about you, Alessia, where the hell can we find you? Oh, you can find me in Telegram groups, mostly, and Facebook. <laughs> and 
No problem. And Julie? Yeah, SEO, what? SEO group chat and um, my profile on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Facebook for me too. My website is Serp Decoder. If you want to check that out for any consulting, SERP, search engine result page, decoder.com. Otherwise, mm -hmm. just Facebook. Perfect. And the, the dreaded, Matt's got like loads of different websites, Matt. Um, but what is the, where is the best place to find you or the quickest way to get a hold of you? Uh, diggitymarketing.com contact form, probably the best. No problem at all. Um, so thank you guys for being on the show. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, Matt's slides, I'm sure, will be shared um, after the webinar, just below um, on YouTube. We'll get them added. Um, and hopefully we'll get you guys on again in the near future and we can discuss more things affiliate marketing. Okay. Thanks a bunch. You've been a great host, Craig. Take care, girls. Nice to see you. See you later.